Gary is one of those people, you know, I obviously am very passionate about what I do. I interview people for a living. I love telling my friends and family about all these exciting people that I interview, but I, he's someone that I always was like, I don't really know how to describe what he does. <laughs> like, what does this guy I don't do? Because he's, he's so talented and he has this um, amazing ability, uh, like this really great guy I worked with back in Chicago, to just know who the bands are that are going to blow up, which I think is such a skill. I mean, you're like a tastemaker, you're a curator. Um, when did you realize you first had that skill? Yeah, this is my new publicist, Lily Hansen. Yeah, um, totally. So <laughs> hey, can I get some money now? My, my, yeah. hype, my hype girl. This is really just to <laughs> showcase my, my taste to the world. Um, I'm kidding. But I don't know. I, I think I was always the person wanting to go to shows, whether I was with friends or by myself, um, particularly in college. I think, I think college just opens up a ton of new experiences, but also just you kind of have all this music at your fingertips here talking to different people on, on your hall or on campus about different things. Uh, I don't know when I had that ability, or if it's ability. I, I think I was always driven to like find music. I think second grade, actually, I, there was like a Secret Santa giveaway, and some girl got voice to men, Cooley High Harmony, and I, <laughs> and I had to have it. And so I, like, I don't even remember what I got, but I traded her, and so that was my first cassette tape. Was probably Mariah me. Carey or something. Yeah, I think it was probably like a scarf or something. I, I was just like, I've got to have some music. Um, cassette tapes were these little things about that size. Okay. Um, but yeah, so for me, it was just always spending time on blogs and spending time talking to friends and going to shows, getting there early to see the bands that were um, the first ones playing at night and, and seeing what was out there. Were you one of those people, I know, um, you know, for me, I, my background is in music journalism, and I realized that I had a real knack for being able to, like, kind of, you know, put my finger on the map and say, that band, that band's going to blow up. And sometimes it was just sort of an intuitive thing, and sometimes it was because I had been working in a music venue and I saw how hard these guys were hustling and they weren't the ones, you know, getting plastered until 3 in the morning, but they were actually going to bed and getting their sleep, you know. <laughs> but for you, I mean, have you ever, you know, said, I think that band is going to really make it big, and they did? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think that's really how I learned that I was good at, you know, finding bands early on. I think I was Fleet Fox's 16th fan on Facebook ever, um, which is weird. Um, I, I think maybe they just recently had launched fans on Facebook, so that might have been part of it. But I was listening to the Black Keys in high school and in 2002, and um, I remember, gosh, probably six years ago, telling everybody that would listen, like, there's this band, Head in the Heart, they're from Seattle, they're going to be the biggest thing. Um, and so I think, I think, yeah, I just I told people about bands that I really enjoyed, and um, I manage a band now, and now I'm telling everybody, trust me, this band is going to be the biggest thing ever, and I think convincing my dad that, yes, this band will be a big thing to come out of Nashville at some point in the next year or so. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's been a fun process just finding bands and then sharing that. I think that's really what my gift through Cause of Scene was supposed to be to other people is there's all this amazing music in the world that is probably under the radar at this point, but um, inviting people into experience where they will they're able to discover them early on as well. So last night I went out and I had a drink with my intern and you know we were talking about um, trust you know because she was telling me that her cousin has a really popular blog in Atlanta and I said well what's it about and she said you know it's about culture and it's about events and I said oh wow people like trust him I mean that's interesting he kind of jumps all over the map and you know they kind of look at this guy to vet their options for them essentially especially in a city as big as Atlanta so Let's talk about trust for a second. Like, when did people begin to trust you that you knew what you were talking about in the music industry? As, as fans or the industry itself? Um, both. Yeah, I think, I think when people came to our shows, it felt really unique and different. Like, house shows have existed for a lot longer than any of us have been around. But I think inviting people into experience that wasn't the normal you know, club or bar experience where they're at, able to walk away with like actual connections and friends and discovering a band that they hadn't heard of. I think once they had, had a good experience and um, became a fan of music that maybe wasn't on their radar before, it's like, oh wow, like, you know, I trusted Larry that one time, maybe I should trust him again. Because so many of our artists, I mean, we've, I think I've done about 250 shows, 700 or so artists the last four or five years. Um, I think once people realize, like, even though I don't know who this is, like, I really, really enjoy their music, I think they're more likely to and trust me after that and come back to see a band that they hadn't seen because we had done several like mystery shows where we didn't announce anything about the show other than the date and those sold out every single time where people were just like 
here, take all my money. I'm like, you don't know what you're actually paying to see. <laughs> um, but we had done a secret show in East Nashville with Malone Bello and Nikki Lane and um, some others. And I think everybody just, I think people thought Sturgill Simpson was playing or something. So, but it was a really great night um, about this time last year. What would make you want to work with a band? I mean, I feel like especially in a city like Nashville, you know, I mean, it's, it's like the age old, you know, joke, you throw a rock and you hit a guitarist, you know? <laughs> so for you, Obviously, being sort of in this position where, you know, I know people were coming to you left and right, wanting to play at your shows. Um, why would you want to, besides being a fan of their music, what would you make you want to work with someone? Is it their work ethic? Is it how seriously they take their career? I think that's part of it. I think it's a combination of things of, like, are people actually going to show up to see this band? Um, will they sound good in this space? So many of the spaces we did, almost exclusively, were spaces that are not sound treated. They're not actual venues, and so we're doing shows at the Solo in their showroom, and we're doing shows in people's backyards in my living room and other people's living rooms. And so typically bands that sounded good acoustically or some sort of stripped down formation. Um, and yeah, bands that I would pay to see, bands that I really enjoy the music of, bands that I feel like had the ability or the, the possibility to really launch to the next level. Because it reflects well on cause of scene if these bands are going from playing to 100 people to playing to Ryman. So I was talking to a guy recently, you know, he runs a um, YouTube network in town, and it was interesting because I said, you know, I was kind of goofing around with an intern of mine the other day, and we started putting out these videos of me talking, just kind of telling stories online, and I said, just out of curiosity, also selfishly, of course, because I, God knows I want to be a YouTube star, what <laughs> makes the cream rise to the top? And he said, well, it's not necessarily the cream, like, don't get that confused, like, there's a lot of crap out there that ends up getting tons of hits. I feel like it's the same thing in music. From your experience working with hundreds and hundreds of bands, um, what does make someone successful in the music industry? Is there sort of a silver bullet? Uh, gosh, I think we're all trying to figure that out. Um, I think it's a combination of things. It's like you have to have great songs to begin with. I think if you don't have great songs, then that band's not going to get anywhere, that artist isn't going to get anywhere. I think having an amazing team around you, I think, really helps. Um, whether that is the actual the band or the artist that is working really, really hard the whole way through. Um, that's something that I'm always looking for when I'm working with a band is like, are they putting in the time and effort or are they, you know, do they have a hundred Facebook fans and they're already like, we need a manager, like we need someone to book us all over the nation. It's like, no, you need to like, you need to put in the sweat equity and really um, work just as hard. Um, because I think when people in the industry or in any industry see people that work hard for what they want um, to achieve, they're a lot more likely to come on board. Do you think people our age want to put in that time? I just feel like, you know, and I have some friends in the audience who have huge social media followings, and I think social media is a wonderful tool, but I also think it's kind of given us this perception these days that stuff should happen overnight. I just remember my dad sitting me down when I was a kid, and he was a musician and a cartoonist, and he said, hey man, I mean, I never made any money doing what I loved till I was like 40. And I was like, okay, yeah. And then, you know, whatever it is, like 20 years later, it's like you see people where they didn't necessarily put in the time, they just sort of lucked out. And I think there's this yeah. sort of misconception that that can happen to all of us, and it's just not true. Yeah, I think you've got to work hard for what you want. Um, I think there was this video years ago that I watched, of, it was talking about Leonardo da Vinci, who was basically seen as a failure up until Mona Lisa was painted, and I think that was, he was like late 40s at that point. But going back through all of his journals and all of the things that he was creating day in and day out of writing out ideas and sketching and painting and um, just putting in the work. And eventually he broke through and now he's seen as one of the most famous painters in the history of the world. Um, I think, yeah, our generation is very much uh, wanting the instant gratification. I had a, a close friend who's an artist manager who said, like, the re one of the reasons people want to play cause of scene shows is they get to skip 10 steps. Um, if they play one of our shows that gets them on other, other people's radars and um, you know, management or publicists or agents or whoever starts paying attention, um, because I don't, I say no to probably 90% of the artists that, that ask to play shows at this point. Oh, that's a huge stat. <laughs> I made it up, but I don't, know if, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if that's accurate 90%, but it's up there. It's a, it's I'm a not high approaching you for anything. It, it's a high, it's <laughs> the a high chance majority. you saying no is pretty low. Yeah, I'm mean. <laughs> So uh, let's talk about money, because God knows we all need money to exist on this planet. Um, 
you like me, and I, I know you and I kind of responded over this, you know, this started off as just like a pass passion project. I mean, like I know for, you know, my book, I mean, it was literally just my photographer, Joshua Black Wilkins and I sitting around having coffee going, wouldn't it be fun to like start a book? And then I was six months later, I was like, this sucks. Like, let's just stop. Like <laughs> if I knew what would go into this, I would have never actually pressed, you know, the green light. But for you, when did that turning point occur where you started seeing your passion project as a business? I, I don't know. It's still like in that process, I think. I, I quit my job at a booking agency March 2013 um, to really pursue this full time. And I think that was where I saw it mostly as a business. I think I was working in the business a lot more than working on the business at that point. I just thought if I worked hard enough and did enough shows, like it would scale. And that year, I think I did 66 shows in 10 months um, by myself. Like, cause of scene's always been me, and then had an assistant this year. But yeah, I think that was where I, I took it more seriously of, because I wasn't in grad school, I wasn't working a full-time job. I was able to really devote all my time towards building this brand. And I think that's where cause of scene kind of, there was a tipping point a little bit where people like started to know the name and the brand and would come to shows whether they knew the artist or not. And, September of that year, I think I did 11 shows in 14 nights. Um, I don't remember those two weeks very well. It was, it was more of a blur than I would have liked, but yeah, I, I think probably about that, that point three years ago. What was the hardest thing about turning it from a passion project into a business? Like I know for me, you know, I've always maintained having a part-time job because for me, I feel like it sort of gives me a little detachment between what I do. And then also, I'm just not someone, I think I'm probably kind of lazy in a way. I don't like to like constantly hustle for writing work or worry about you know some asshole who didn't pay me to write his bio or whatever. So for you, I know that you always had part-time jobs. Um, what was it like going from doing this part-time as a passion project to doing it full-time? Yeah, I think it ratcheted up the pressure quite a bit. Um, when I was doing all the other jobs and everything else and, and in grad school cause of scene was an escape it's what I went to to get away from everything else of it was fun there was no strings attached of this needs to make a thousand dollars or five hundred dollars or whatever um, I think the pressure yeah intensified quite a bit um, before it was like I can do this show and if it makes 50 bucks it makes 50 bucks but hey it was a great experience and I think when I was shifting it became gosh that was an amazing show and a lot of people showed up but we're walking away in the red and it, it just sort of it muddied it for me. It made it a little, a little less clear of what or why I was doing it. Um, yeah, I think that's a big part of it. Did that happen a lot? I mean, because I know you and I have had the conversation where, you know, um, we said the most irritating phrase, and if anyone said this to me, I apologize for saying this, but it's when people say, you're killing it, you're killing it. And I'm like, well, not really. I mean, because financially, like, like yeah. I'm doing pretty shitty right now, you know? <laughs> but I mean, again, it's like people see, you know, social media, they see you pulling out the credit card to pay for something, and you're like, oh, I don't really have the money to do that, you know? Yeah. So I feel like... We just constantly feel the need to like keep up this like kind of uh, persona or like no. perception in real life. I think I think social media is the king of that. I think it's really easy to paint one picture and the reality be a little bit different. It might not be that much different, but I think I'm really good with words when I'm typing out on Instagram and can kind of paint a picture of you know there's a thousand people in my living room. It feels like when you're and you're like ready to run through a wall after reading and it, it's like that was a tough night sometimes. So. Yeah, I think it's, I don't know, I think the more vulnerable, honestly, you are through social media, I think the more people really respond. Um, so I think I learned that lesson, like, paint the great picture of, like, this is the most amazing show, but not every show is the most amazing show with the greatest fan in the world. And so I think when you're able to really be yourself through social media, I think people latch onto that a little bit more. It feels more authentic, maybe. What were some of the challenges of running a business? I know for me, um, one of the things I always found it hard was to price my abilities. You know, um, I can charge more money in Chicago than I can in Nashville. You know, um, and there are other things that I had to really kind of learn how to do. Uh, lead, you know, a, a couple of interns as my team. You know, knowing how to delegate. So for you, learning to be a leader, what was that like? Uh, it was challenging. I, I felt like I was getting an MBA in, in real life most of the time and had no idea what I signed up for, um, for the most part, but I loved it. I, I think the experience I've gained the last five years doing Cause of Scene is probably more valuable than I would have gotten anywhere else um, working for someone else. 
um, yeah, tons of learning lessons, learning how to delegate. I'm still like learning that process a lot. And yeah, it's, it's a lot to take on a business, particularly by, by myself. Like I love the world of entrepreneurship, but being a solopreneur is, is pretty rough, like doing it by yourself. And you had to make some pretty hard decisions, right? Because I know that you were approached by several people who wanted to kind of turn cause the scene into like a live nation and you know what we would all kind of refer to as selling out. And I think there's sort of like a fine line there between yeah. obviously needing to keep the ship afloat and make money, but not wanting to compromise your vision. For, yeah, for me it's always been like, how do we maintain the heart and, and the soul of cause the scene? How do we make it like true? Um, true to my experience, true to other people's experiences, and not feel too salesy or too corporate or all these different things. But I had talked to a company maybe a year and a half ago that was interested in acquiring Cosacine, and I was kind of like, acquiring what? Like my house? Like to throw shows? Or like <laughs> like, like what, what part of, you know, what does 100% look like exactly? And, you know, one of the folks I had been meeting with posed this hypothetical question to me of and when we were talking about ways to scale and the business model and kind of different layers and he said, you know, say Pepsi comes to you and gives you a million dollars to throw a secret show with Nickelback, what do you do? And like, without blinking, I said, I absolutely turn that down. Um, he said, well, why would you turn that down? It's a million dollars, it's Pepsi, it's a great press. I was like, Nickelback is not a band that I, I mean, Nickelback tends to be the band that everyone gets to just make fun of, which is maybe justifiable. But um, <laughs> if this goes out to YouTube and there's Nickelback fans watching, I'm so sorry. Um, but I, I think for me, it was like, I wouldn't, go see that band. It's not something that I would be passionate about. And so I think, yeah, there were those difficult decisions of how do we grow this while maintaining what is true at its core. Mm -hmm. Did you find that people wanted to pay for music these days? No. I think that's, yeah, I think everybody kind of understands that. I think we want stuff for free. Um, we want experiences for free. I think, you know, someone had asked me, like, what is your competition? I don't think there's a whole lot of people, like, wanting to launch house show businesses across the world, <laughs> I would highly discourage it. Um, but I think when there's so many options, particularly in a place like Nashville, where one, it's Music City, and there's a hundred different shows every single night, but there's also like, there's so much community already happening that I think if people already have community through like a dinner at their friend's house or running out and getting drinks, um, I think that in, honestly becomes competition for our shows. Yeah, I think people are willing to pay for something that feels bigger than themselves, that feels like an experience that they're going to remember for a really long time. Mm -hmm. And so on the flip side, that where they are willing to pay, I think, is to have this experience with bands that they would see playing 500,000 cap rooms, but in the confines of a house or a secret show in a random location for 100. So. I was talking about this with my intern last night. You know, I was admitting to her that I have a real hang-up about um, putting out stuff for free. You know, I made a decision January 1st of this year that every single Monday throughout the duration of the year I was going to put out an interview for free. And until that point, I had never done that. You know, I had wrapped everything up into a book and said, 30 bucks, give it to me now, cash or check. <laughs> um, and, you know, I was telling her, I said, how do you make people value stuff? In a world where we are expected to give our goods away for free, you know, how do you convince someone that's worth paying ten bucks to go to a house show to have that experience? Yeah, I think you have to make it really personal for people. Um, I, th I think that was that's been something with Cause of Scene is that you're not going to get that when you're going to see a show in a club um, of having that personal introduction from someone at the door. Like I, I was always trying to find people at a house show or at a secret show in a barber shop around town or wherever of like, hey, you need to know this person. And so I think when they walk away, it's almost like out of sight, out of mind with the money, but it's like I walked away with an incredible experience that was worth beyond the 12 or 15 or $20. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that answered that, but. Kind of, I'm just, I'm just curious, you know, I, I feel like, you know, it's interesting that I, I get emails pretty often after I interview people and, you know, they always kind of for the most part, say the same thing, and you know, and a lot of times what they say is, "Wow, I haven't had a conversation like that in a while." You know, I haven't like actually sat down with someone and had them like really listen to me and see me and hear me and like, you know, it was like our good friend Kevin Grosh from the Maiden yeah. Network said recently. He said, "It's all in the posture." You know, you're not like waiting for that person to like shut up so you can like give your answer. So for you, why is connection so important? And like, how did you? I mean, do you feel like you really established that with your brand, that sense of community? Yeah, I think 
I think Cause of Scene was a manifestation of like my heart for the world. Like I wanted people to feel like they fit in, that they were seen and they were known, they were loved. Um, it just so happened that I love music and that's where everything kind of got funneled towards with shows. Yeah, so connection was really key for me because of moving around all the time. Like I was the new kid every two or three years and it made college great because I was easy to, you know, I could adapt to the whole world and everyone else was venturing out to the world for the very first time. But when I moved back to Nashville, I saw people kind of spread out all over and I felt like people were missing out on people's stories or connections. And um, for me, like I've had this amazing gift the last several years to connect with so many people around the city and like that's a gift that I want to like, immediately give back to other people who are moving here you know every day every week um, that do not have those connections so music's kind of irrelevant it was just sort of the tool uh, not irrelevant I, I think it's it, it was the thing that felt most authentic to me um, it's some place that I felt like I had some semblance of authority of um, being able to tell people about bands I don't think if I was telling them about art around the city, like they would be listening to me because I don't know a whole lot about art, but I know music and different things. So um, I think it was, was it two months ago you decided to press the pause button? Yeah, um, a friend called it, I was mothballing cause a scene. I was put in the attic for a little while. Okay. And just putting everything on hold. We did a 35 city tour this summer. I uh, worked on that for about seven months. It was the most exhausting uh, thing I've ever done in my entire life and maybe the most exhausting thing I I'll do at any point in the future. Um, but we, were, we started planning that in February. Uh, we're on the road July 1st to August 28th. And it was amazing, like getting to meet people in Fayetteville and Kansas City and Durham, like that I probably would have never met in my life. And, and to hear people like, we need this in our city, like we need something special like this. But I was burned out. Um, I, right before the tour, you know, ended up in the hospital in the ER, was in bed for six or seven days. and. You know, all the, the doctors ran tests and they said, like, you're perfectly healthy. Um, it's like, no, I'm not. Like, I, <laughs> I'm like, sitting here with an IV tube like, in my like, arm. It's like, why do I fall over when I get out of bed? Um, that sounds really scary. And it kind of was for a little while. It was um, exhaustion, though, obviously. Yeah, it was, it was stress, it was anxiety, it was exhaustion. Um, I think I had just, like, brought myself to the breaking point or past it too many times. And um, I think I was just putting way too much pressure on myself of, like, this thing has to like be the end all be all and we have to walk away like making boo koodles of money. Boo koodles, that's kind of fun. Um, but <laughs> I think that's a really old phrase. But anyway, <laughs> and we walked away from it probably in the red, honestly. And, but it was an amazing experience and um, the artists that we got to work with are gonna be friends probably for the rest of my life. And but it was just time to hit the pause button and like cause a scene is something I'm always gonna come back to. Um, we'll probably do shows. There's always gonna be artists that I wanna work with. There's artists that I've worked with in the past I would love to do shows with and there's artists that are probably like writing songs somewhere at Belmont right now that don't even exist as a band that could be the next big thing that I'd, I'd love to work with at some point. But yeah, for now it's, for now it's on hold, it's in hibernation. Was that hard to do? To build up so much momentum yeah. over the you know, course of five years and then you know, basically say, listen guys, like, I, I don't know what's gonna happen, this is just gonna be something I'm always passionate about, but I need to take care of myself right now. Because I feel like what you and I have talked about a lot is, you know, especially millennials or people who are in our age group, we don't really prioritize that. Like we are like so focused on our career that a lot of times, I know for me personally, I've also let my health slip. Yeah, I think we, we really value the hustle and grinding it out sometimes, which is great qualities. Like you have to work hard, but I think you can, you can grind yourself right into the ground. Um, and for me, like I was at a retreat in February outside of Atlanta and the question was posed to a lot of us of like, is it selfish to take good care of yourself? And like, of course the answer is no, it's not selfish, but my initial reaction in my head is like, yeah, I can't, I can't take time to do that. Like I need to be investing in everybody else and I can't rest. And um, it was this wake up call of like, hang on, like, you know, I will burn out. And there's actually a quote, I'm gonna fucking read it. A friend, uh, posted this the other day of kind of pivoting and, and taking time for yourself. And I thought this was incredible. The first part of the quote is from a book called Creativity, Inc. about Pixar. And it says, for many people, changing course is also a sign of weakness, tantamount to admitting that you don't know what you're doing. This strikes me as particularly bizarre. 
Personally, I think the person who can't change his or her mind is dangerous. And then she goes on to say, you may have studied or worked on or invested in something for years only to realize lately that it isn't what you really want, that it doesn't align with your dreams or long-held ideals or ideas of what you would like for your life to look like. Maybe you need to chart a different course, change directions, abandon your safe house, see if the grass really is greener. Maybe you need to get creative in order to move towards what you think you might really love. Maybe it feels like, as it often does for me, give up, get inspired, give up, get inspired. Whatever you do, keep walking your path and just know that sometimes it takes substantial energy to move. And I like read that like a month into taking a break from everything and that was like, that feels so true. Like that feels so real to me of, um, I think my passion and love for what I was doing kind of drifted away a little bit um, over the last year or so. And it's like, there's a lot of other stuff in the world that like, there's a lot of other people coming up with amazing dreams and amazing um, initiatives and like so many things here in this building. So it's like, I want to be part of someone else's dream. And if Cause is Seen gets to a, a bigger level or if it be, just becomes a passion project exclusively, I'm, I'm pretty okay with whatever. Right on. All right, well, I'm out of questions. Does anyone in the audience have anything that I didn't hit on? They want to ask Larry? Robbie? Oh gosh! Still, uh, where do you see yourself in three years? <laughs> trying to think. Of I'm, I'm, well, I'm hoping the world doesn't end after November 9th. So, um, I'm st I think I'll still be in Nashville. Um, I don't know what I'll be doing. I think this has been like a very there's kind of a question mark on the next phase of life. It's starting to have a lot more clarity in the last couple weeks. But I hope I'm working in an entrepreneurial setting of helping people do really big things, um, helping make the world a more beautiful place and making it, I'm um, just making a dent in the world and, and shining a light somewhere. Sarah? Uh, you guys can fight over it. <laughs> do you have any other passion projects coming up? Yeah, so a, a lot of, that's such a good question. Um, both of those are. And yeah, I have a lot of ideas percolating for on this next phase of Cause of Scene next year. Um, I'm trying to figure out if kind of where the passion is coming from, if that fits within the brand or if it's an entirely different brand. Uh, I think right now managing a band called Bird Talker is very much a passion project. Um, eventually, I think it'll be a job, but right now it's definitely an investment. Um, and it's just fun. It's, it's music that I absolutely love. It's people that I adore. And so there's, there's a lot of passion and love in that. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. I think that's been something that I've like, had in my head for a long time of what would it look like to, to bring people into an experience around art, around authors, or around um, like a Creative Mornings TED Talk kind of thing where it's people just kind of sharing their story. And, and so, so I think all of those would be verticals I'd want to explore. Food would be amazing. Um, I, th I think I looked to Dinner Lab quite a bit while, when Dinner Lab was around of like, it's a higher price point, it's a really amazing experience being around a table together with people I think is even more of a community experience um, than music, of seeing a show, just because it's, you're able to conversate with people and um, it's just like a really intimate uh, experience, I think. So yeah, all of those. And just and growing it into other markets and um, yeah, doing that. Saying that and doing that are, are two completely different things, but that's where my head's at with it. Yes, ma'am. Yes, you were a solopreneur, right, Larry? Absolutely. Has your thinking changed in your next venture to where you might um, work to have a team? And do you think that would make a difference in terms of um, your ability to sustain the business? 100%. Uh, absolutely. I think, I think so much of what led to burnout was just trying to do everything um, on my own and, and not really being sure which hat to put on at which time. Because um, there, there were so many things that were just immediate needs of to advance a show or to find a location and, you know, Seattle. I'm not quite sure how I did either. Um, and I think I just wanted it so badly. Um, I think I wanted it so badly that I was just willing to 
maybe not take good care of myself for a while. Um, but that's been a question I've been asked a lot um, in previous interviews or on panels of like, if you could go back and do anything differently, what would you do? And I said, I would, I would start with the team. I think when I conceived of Cause of Scene, it was, it was just a hobby. It was a way to bring friends together and bring strangers together and, um, because that's really safe to bring strangers you've never seen into your living room. Um, but thankfully, nothing, ever, nothing bad ever happened. Um, and, but it was conceived as a hobby. And I think that the snowball effect started happening after you know, the first year I did 28 shows. And my goal was, well, maybe I can meet enough bands to do one show a month. And I was always saying, like, gosh, if I ever got that band, like, I've made it. And they were playing three weeks later. And if I ever got that band, and then a band I just hosted would be like, oh, yeah, they're like our best friends. Like, we just toured together. So I think the momentum started to ramp up so quickly that I didn't even realize I had a business. I think I sort of stumbled entrepreneurship in, in some form or fashion. Yeah. So you mentioned that you didn't want to be like a live engineer. You know, you have this big focus on curation. Like, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I think it's possible, yeah. I, I think, yeah, I think it's definitely possible. I, when I go to Ascend, and I think Live Nation books Ascend, it feels really, really special. I think one, just the setting, being where it is in the city, I think there's a certain level, despite it being 6,000 people, that it can feel intimate. I think to, to make it really small, to partner with bigger artists, like you have to have brands on board um, that are footing the bill, um, but brands that are aligned with both what we do or what Live Nation does or with the, with the bands themselves. Um, for me, like, I always wanted to go the opposite direction. Um, you know, if Live Nation or AG or AC or any of them, which are all amazing companies with great people, like, if they're zigging one way, like, I want to zag the other way. If they're buying amphitheaters or arenas or festivals, like, and getting larger and larger, like, I want to get as small as possible. Like, how do we create a really rich experience with 50, 100, 200 people in a, in a space um, where people are walking away of like, I've seen that band 10 times, but I've never seen them like that. That was the best show I've ever seen. So I think it's possible, but I don't know if anyone's really figured it out yet. Yeah. Yeah. Whew. That's a, another really good question. Um, I think it's just inviting people into a story, uh, most, of, most of all. Um, for me, for a long time, like Cause a Scene and Larry Close were the exact same thing on social media platforms. So I think I was able to be very real and open um, just about burnout or doubt or fears. Um, I think Cause a Scene as a, as a movement has been really about that. Of, I have no background whatsoever in music. I don't play. I, I didn't get a degree from Belmont I, or MTSU or anywhere else. It was just, I, I think, just sharing that passion. But that, hey, sometimes a passion, like a lot of fear and resistance can come to. Um, and I think, honestly, like when I'm able to share like those sides of things where it's not so rosy, I think that's when people step in or like, gosh, like me too. Like I get that. When I'm talking about a sold out show, I don't think it inspires anybody to like, you know, go write the next great novel or something, but it's like, this is really tough. And if you really want this, it's gonna take a lot of sacrifice. I think people, it's like, oh, that's, that's my personal experience too, and I'm not alone in that. Um, so I don't know if there's ever like a perfect balance, but I think it's just being willing to share of yourself. Yeah. So did you get a lot of negative backlash when you were so vulnerable? Online, or did you get more support? Or was I think it was mostly support. It was really positive. Um, someone said, like, if you're if you're doing things right, you're going to have a whole lot of haters, um, which is such like a millennial term. But um, I don't feel like there are a whole lot of haters, at least publicly. Um, and I think I knew like what where the boundary was in terms of being vulnerable. 
Um, I don't think I was necessarily like sharing my, my deepest, darkest like fears or insecurities, but um, I think people were willing to like step into that and embrace it and um, yeah, I just care for me or care for cause a scene in the middle of that. It's a way to really use social media to expand the connection. Absolutely. Cool. All right, right on. Well, Larry will be hanging out afterwards if anyone wants to approach him individually. Um, and next month, I will be interviewing uh, jewelry designer Judith Bright, fourth Tuesday of the month, 8 a.m., bright and early. And uh, I can't thank you enough, Larry. Honestly, this thank was you, awesome. Lily. So Thank um, you all. Yeah. And everyone have an awesome Tuesday.